Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hi, I'm Dr. Eileen Chung, and this is part one of the rapid review of EM Cases episode six on transient ischemic attack. In part one of this review, we'll cover what a TIA is and things that may look like TIAs but aren't, and we'll talk about how you can tell them apart. We'll also cover what the source of your patient's TIA might be, which will help us figure out what tests we need to get for them in the ER. Let's start by talking about what a TIA is and what it isn't. Well, we're talking about the brain, so neurologic dysfunction is a must. And then the name pretty much sums it up, transient ischemic attack. How transient are we talking about? The updated definition is that the neurologic dysfunction lasts less than an hour, and it's an ischemic or vaso-occlusive event. So the neurologic dysfunction should be focal, either to the brain or to the retina. What are the most common diagnoses that can mimic but are not TIAs? First up, we have the ER doc's most embarrassing, easily reversible cause of neurologic dysfunction, hypoglycemia. Yes, it can present with focal neurologic symptoms. Don't forget to check a capillary glucose. The second diagnosis to consider is a Todd's paresis. This is a residual focal neurologic deficit in the post-ictal state in someone who's had a seizure with a known underlying CNS lesion, like a previous stroke or a tumor. Getting previous medical history is very useful to figure this one out. The third mimic to consider is a migraine equivalent with visual defects. Essentially, this is a migraine aura without the actual headache and can be associated with numbness or speech disturbance. It's not common in young people, but is a much more common diagnosis in people who are older than 50. Unfortunately, so are TIs and strokes. So you can keep this one in the back of your mind, but it's a diagnosis best left to a neurologist to make. We know that the vast majority of TIAs are from the anterior circulation, so that's what we're going to focus on here when we cover key features on history and physical exam, which are the most helpful to diagnose a TIA. Part two of this rapid review will cover features that are red flags for posterior circulation strokes. Remember, a TIA is a vaso-occlusive event, so the two most convincing features of a TIA on history will be that the neurologic deficit is abrupt in onset and focal to a vascular territory. And because the majority of TIAs are from the anterior circulation, the focal deficit is usually going to be motor, speech, or both, as opposed to things like paresthesias, dizziness, or generalized weakness. The most helpful neurologic abnormalities on physical exam that would make you think of a true TIA are abnormal speech, facial droop, and a pronator drift. Other important parts of the neurologic exam include assessing level of consciousness, the pupils and extraocular movements, finger extension, and gait. What's not so helpful is checking the strength in big muscle groups like the deltoids and biceps and grip strength since it's hard to actually detect weakness in these muscles. A quick cardiovascular exam looking for abnormalities in the heart rate, blood pressure, and rhythm, especially looking for AFib, is useful, as is listening for carotid breweries. Now that we've covered what a TIA is and its distinguishing features from other diagnoses, let's move on to the different types of TIAs and what this means for ER investigations. There are four main types or etiologies of TIA. Keeping these four types in mind will help you remember the four investigations that are important to a TIA workup. The first type is cardioembolic, with the source of vaso occlusion coming from the heart. The predominant reason for a cardioembolic TIA is going to be atrial fibrillation. Other less common cardioembolic sources would be things like an LV aneurysm, CHF, rheumatic heart disease, and endocarditis. The second source of TIA is from the large vessels of the head and neck. Here we're usually talking about stenosis and emboli from the carotid arteries or the anterior and middle cerebral arteries. Occasionally, dissection of one of these arteries instead of emboli can be the reason for a TIA. The third type of TIA is from small vessel disease, also known as a lacunar infarct. This is from thrombosis of the small arteries in the brain itself. And the fourth type is actually grab bag of stuff. Either these are not true ischemic attacks and are actually other diagnoses like intracerebral hemorrhage or brain tumor, 
or they may be TIAs, but from rare causes like vasculitis or clotting disorders. So now that we've covered the four types of TIAs, let's talk about the four main investigations that need to be done in the ER. The purpose of these essential tests are twofold. One is to rule out non-ischemic stroke entities, including things in that fourth grab bag category. And the second is to help you figure out which type of TIA your patient may have had. To look for a cardioembolic source, do an EKG. You're primarily looking for AFib here, but other EKG abnormalities like bundle branch blocks or ST elevation from an LV aneurysm can give you a clue to major structural heart disease. In this case, you may want to arrange an echocardiogram more urgently, even though this is not normally a priority test for ER docs in the case of a TIA patient. You also want to get a CT head in these patients. A CT head can help you rule out non-ischemic causes of your patient's presentation, and it can also tell you if the patient's not just had a TIA, but a full-out stroke, and what vascular territory that stroke is from. Third, you'll want some blood work, including CBC, lights, creatinine, and an INR. This again will help you rule out some unexpected causes of your patient's presentation. And the INR will help you in managing your patient in case he or she's actually had an intracranial hemorrhage instead of a TIA. Finally, your patient needs urgent vascular imaging of the large vessels of their neck. This is likely the test that will make the most difference in outcome in terms of preventing a stroke after a patient has had a TIA. How soon does this vascular imaging need to happen? Well, we know the largest risk of a stroke after TIA is within the next seven days. And we know that a carotid end arterectomy done for significant stenosis within two weeks of a TIA reduces the chance of a stroke by 30%. That's why catching a large vessel cause urgently is so important. So this vascular imaging needs to happen within the next one to three days if you can't get it immediately in the ER. If it seems unlikely that this is going to happen as an outpatient, either because of logistical or social reasons, advocate for the patient to be admitted for this crucial test. Now, which imaging modality should you use? A carotid Doppler is probably the most accessible and is non-invasive and is what you should order if that's what you have access to. However, the downsides to a Doppler are that it can't see significant stenosis of the intracranial large vessels, and it's not actually that accurate at identifying the degree of carotid stenosis. So it could potentially misclassify significant operable stenosis as one that's not. A CT angiogram of the head and neck, if you can get one, is the better test. Not only can you see intracranial, extracranial, and tandem large vessel stenoses, you can also pick up vessel dissection as a more rare but equally dangerous cause of TIA. Let's review. Diagnosing a TIA can be tricky. Some key features that may help you distinguish a true TIA from its mimics include abrupt onset of symptoms and focal neurologic deficits. Abnormal speech, facial droop, and pronator drift are helpful distinguishing features on exam. Remember there are four main types of TIAs, cardioembolic, large vessel, small vessel, and a grab bag of other causes. And the four tests that need to happen in the ER or shortly thereafter are to help you figure out what the source of your patient's TIA might be in order to help you prevent a stroke from happening. These tests are the EKG, vascular imaging, a CT head, and lab work. I'll see you in part two of this rapid review, where we'll cover risk stratification and safe disposition of these patients.